We are at the end of Mark, and if you look in your Bible, you probably have a notation. Now, King James might not have this, but other, other versions will. Mine says, the earliest manuscripts and some other witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. So we're going to deal with the question of verses 9 through 20. It's going to take two weeks to get there. This week is going to be all the preliminary information before we actually get to verse 9 through 20. So you can look that over, and, and we'll look at that closer next week. But today is going to be more, more like uh, a classroom setting, more like a, a college course, more like we're looking at a syllabus rather than notes. And, but it, it's necessary information. It might get technical uh, here and there. Is something not working? Yes, we're doing Facebook Live. Right there. Okay. I, I'm not used to the signals. I don't understand them all. So, so yeah, so this will be a little bit technical, and, and we'll get through this. I don't like to do this all that often, um, but we're going to do this. So look at your notes. And the, the topic for today is, is textual criticism. And, and textual criticism is kind of some big words. I want to give a couple illustrations, then we're going to define it, and then we're going to talk about why it's, why it's important. So the first thing in your notes is Theology 101. So I'm a 19, 20-year-old in Bible school. It's a sunny day. We're sitting out under the big, giant oak tree that has picnic tables under it, enough picnic tables for our whole class to be there. There's a slight breeze blowing. It's a really nice day, Southern California, and we're doing class, and my teacher, whose, whose name is Dewey Bertolini, um, he's doing his thing, and, and he, he likes to kind of create controversy and then bring you to a point where you can solve it. And, and a lot of times you can see it coming, but on, on this day in particular, I did not see it coming. I was not paying that close of attention. I didn't like meeting outside because there was too many noises and distractions, and, and I, I can be easily distracted on occasion. So, uh, But I was, I was in class this day. I was, I was actively engaged, and he was, he was prompting us, even poking us, with the question, can we trust the Bible? And, of course, we'd say, yes, we can trust the Bible, and then he'd say, how do you know that? And we'd give an answer, and then he would he would contradict it, and we'd give another answer, and he'd contradict it, and he just kind of, I think he was having a little too much fun that day, and he was pushing the docket, and he was getting, getting us going, and I was, I was sucked in, I was dialed in, and I was like tunnel vision on this topic, and, and we're discussing it, and I remember at some point in time, I, I took my Bible in my hand, and I held it up in the air, and I kind of shook it at him, and I said, if we can't trust this book, we can't trust anything like I'm going to show you. And he, and he got this big smile on his face, and he says, I think you've got it. And then I knew I'd been sucked in. And, but I'll never forget that moment because that, that was a moment in time where challenged in the face of scriptural authority, I was willing to stand up to my favorite teacher who, who was coming across like he wasn't on board. And, and I want to tell you that... In 30 years of experience as a pastor, 30 years of teaching, 30 years of opening the Bible, trying to figure out what it says, trying to communicate what it says, 30 years of doing this, I have not lost that conviction. If, if it would help, I'd hold this Bible up and I'd wave it in your face. This is the Word of God. This is the authority that we stand on. If, if I teach anything but what the Bible says, I'm teaching my opinion, and it should be left out. We only teach what the Bible says. And, and I, I, I say this because I don't want you to think that I have any questions here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you through some, some technical stuff that if you're not getting the big picture, you might go, why did he say that? Or I hadn't thought of that. Because there are things you may not have thought of that are true, but on the surface sound like we're questioning God's word. But when you really think them through, they're actually building the case for God's word. So we're going to go through some of that, some of that process in the 30 years I've been teaching, I have found that the Bible is the best set of instructions for almost everything. I made a little a list here. It was the best set of instructions for parenting, uh, for, for family life, for pastoring, 
for daily living, for business. It was even the best book I had for, for sports and, and how to relate in, in athletics and that kind of stuff. So it, it, it always is and it always will be the Word of God. And, and that's, what our, that's what our whole church is, is founded on. We're Heritage Bible Church. We're not, we're not Heritage Tradition Church. We're not Heritage Feel Good Church. We're not Heritage Whatever Flies Now Church. We're Heritage Bible Church. And we're going to stick with the scriptures. I actually want to show you a video to kind of introduce this textual criticism. And this is a video that, that is actually shown at the Ark Encounter. If you, if you travel to uh, Cincinnati, I would really encourage you to go there. That's where I first saw it. I had to get a copy of it, so I got a copy and I've saved it. I've showed it to a lot of people. But this is a very simplified illustration of textual criticism or the results of it. So go ahead and watch this video. Have you ever heard someone claim that the Bible's been through so many changes and so many revisions that we really can't know what the original message was? Let's use some coffee beans to illustrate a major problem with that argument. And what we're gonna do is look at the manuscript evidence for some ancient writings compared to the manuscript evidence for the New Testament. That is, we're gonna be looking at the handwritten copies made before the days of the printing press for each of these works. For example, for Tacitus, he wrote his famous work called The Annals around the year AD 100. And the earliest copy we have for that comes from about 750 years later. So there's a 750 year gap between when it was written and our earliest copy. And how many copies do we have? Just two. So let's put two beans in this cup to represent those manuscripts. For Plato's dialogues, there's a 1200 year gap and we have just seven copies. For the histories by Herodotus, there's a 1300 year gap with just nine copies. And we have 10 copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars after a 900 year gap. Now, very few people question whether we have the original message of these writings, yet they constantly attack the Bible on this point. And yet the manuscript evidence we have for these is so minimal and the gap between when they were written and when their earliest copies come from is enormous. So what about the New Testament? Well, it was written in the first century AD and the earliest manuscript evidence we have for it comes within 50 years of that time. Now, how many copies do we have? Well, there are nearly 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts and they average about 450 pages each. Looks like I should have used a bigger cup. But you know what? That's just the Greek manuscripts. When we count the other languages like Latin, Coptic, and Armenian, there's another 20,000 manuscripts. As I mentioned earlier, critics and skeptics rarely question whether we have the original message of these writings, and yet they frequently attack the Bible on this point. You know, it really just shows their bias. But when we look at the evidence before us, we see that their arguments really don't amount to a hill of beans. Where we're gonna wind up with at the end of today is, is that we can trust our Bibles. And, and he gave you a very simple illustration compared to four other books, which, which we don't question at all. Their, their, their historicity, the, that they say what they, they, they intended to be said. We have copies, we can study them, all this stuff. No question at all. Yet we have the scriptures, which are always in question. We have all this evidence. And it's the evidence, those beans represent uh, textual criticism. So I want to go through this. Look at your notes. Here's a couple definitions of textual criticism. And so number one, uh, using tightly honed methods to test variant readings found in various biblical manuscripts. The goal is to find the most ancient and most accurate reading. And, and so, you know, questions automatically arise from the definition. Why do we need to test variant readings? And, and what are variant readings? And, and why are there various biblical manuscripts? Don't we have a manuscript? And don't we have single Readings, why are there variant? Why are there more than one reading? Why do we have to test them? Well, if you, actually, if you study in, in uh, inspiration and, and you give it a, a very biblical definition, you have to say that the original writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when Paul sat down with his pen, 
the Holy Spirit worked through him so that in his own words, using his own personality, he wrote down the very words of God. So that Paul wrote the very words of God and, and that letter to the Corinthians or to the Ephesians is inspired by God and became part of the word of God. And then that, that letter was passed on and in order for more people to see it and more people to get to read it, they copied it. And so then there became second generation copies and third generation copies. Eventually there were copies of copies. And we actually don't have a single original document. We don't have the piece of paper that Paul wrote on. Paul wrote from prison a lot of times. The paper he wrote on is probably low quality paper. It, it wasn't probably thought of as something that needs to be preserved. But as time passed on, scribes would, would write things down so they would be recorded, so they would be preserved. So they started using high quality paper and high quality ink, and those are the copies that we do have. And so we, we don't have the originals, and so in the various copies we have variances. That's the word they use. So there'll be a little change here and a little change there, sometimes a bigger change. We're looking at one of the biggest changes, if not the biggest change, between some of the manuscripts in Mark 16, 9 through 20, and, and we'll talk about that specifically next week. So they're going to test the variant readings, and, and it, says, it says tightly honed. Uh, this is not a light study. This is not something you do on Wednesday nights or in your discipleship group. This is not something you take up as a hobby. This is very technical, uh, very difficult studies, and you have to know languages and, and all this kind of stuff. And you might have a, a 400 page text, you might have a 400 word text, you might have a fragment of a piece of paper that has 30 words on one side, you might have something with 10 words on both sides. So there's all these documents you have to work, work through, and it, it's tightly honed, it's, it's a test. Here's a second definition. Textual criticism is determining what the original manuscripts of the Bible said. So the goal is to figure out what the originals did say. And, and you do this by gathering as many ancient manuscripts as possible, and there's over 25,000 out there, and comparing them word for word. And that's one of the reasons this is a hard task, and it's, it's one of the reasons that people who do this uh, get paid to devote their time specifically to this endeavor. And so of that 25,000 manuscripts, here's some we have, some of the important ones. Uh, we have a complete copy of the four Gospels and the book of Acts that, that date in the 200s. So that would be just uh, uh, within a couple hundred years of, of their writing. Uh, we have a complete copy of the New Testament, the, the entire New Testament, dating back to 325. And we have a complete copy of the entire Bible dating back to the year 350. And then, of course, a recent discovery is the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we have all those texts which, which multiplied the number of manuscripts we had. And as you look at manuscripts, the older the manuscript you have, uh, the more credibility it has. And the, the more intact it is, the more credibility it has. So having these manuscripts for the 200s and the 300s are a big deal. And so the, the textual critic will compare all these things, and, and they'll go through through proven methods to determine what the original, the original manuscript said. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how that happens as we move on, but that's, that's the definition. Don't lose me yet. I know that was not that exciting, but we need it. Okay, so the question is, why do we need it? Why do we need these people to study all these manuscripts and all these fragments of manuscripts? Why do we need them to do this study? Why is it important? It's important, A, in your notes, so that we can be confident we are reading God's word and not man's word. So we can be absolutely sure we're reading God's word and not man's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired by God. Uh, God saying exactly what he wants to say through the writer. That's inspiration. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. Here's why textual criticism is important. Here's why we need to know that we're reading the right words is because anything a man came up with is fallible. If, if I give you my best opinion on a subject, you should take it as an opinion. It has room for error. It can be challenged. It can be overruled. It can be proven wrong. 
It, it may work, it may not work. There's, there's a risk factor. And, and if Scripture has man changing it, adding their own thoughts, adding their own opinions, taking things out and putting things in, and messing it all up, all of a sudden this verse isn't true. Because then not all Scripture is inspired by God. So if we can make sure we have the original text in front of us, translated into English, we can make sure that all Scripture is inspired, and then we can use it for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And we can use it with a 100% expectation that it's absolutely true and correct. We can apply it directly, and it's never going to fail us, and it's never going to backfire. So we need to know that we're reading the right Scripture. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So Scripture guides us so that we don't stumble daily. That's what lamp unto my feet. I'm going to see the stumbling blocks right in front of me, and I'm going to step over them and move around them. And a light unto my path. I see, I see uh, the direction I need to go. I see the future a little more lit up so I can head that direction. Well, man's word isn't going to do that. Man's word is one of the stumbling blocks that we trip on. And man's plans and man's directions are some of the things that get in our way. So this scripture wouldn't be true if, if we were not sure we had the inspired words and not someone else's. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word hid in my heart directs my conscience and, and can affect my thinking and, and my behavior. God's word can, can keep me from sin. My word's not going to do that. Kalani's word isn't going to do that. Randall's word isn't going to do that. I can have a lot of people's opinions that I consider, but, but their words aren't at the level of truth to really change and, and guide my thinking and behavior. God's word is. So I have to have God's word. 2 Peter 2a says, but, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there were false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. There were false teachers then, there's false teachers now. If we don't have the original message, if we don't have as close to the original manuscript as possible, we might be led astray by someone who alters it, who twists it, who changes it, who adds a little bit here and there. So textual criticism is important so that we can open our book called the Bible and we can read any part of it and, and cover any subject in it and have confidence that we're reading the Word of God. If we don't have the confidence that we're reading the Word of God, then we might as well just ask somebody else what they think. So contextual criticism gives us confidence. It gives us confidence. Uh, second reason we need it, B in your notes, to protect God's word from those who desire to change it. There have been those over the course of history that have desired to change God's word. There is a translation of the Bible called the Joseph Smith translation. It's also called the Inspired Translation. It is available on Amazon. You can get for $14.95, you can get a, a simple copy of it, and for a couple hundred bucks, you can get a really ornate copy of it. Now, the Mormon church officially does not endorse the translation because they readily admit that Joseph Smith was not able to translate anything. He wasn't able to read the original languages. He wasn't able to do the work. He actually did it through what we would call witchcraft and that kind of stuff. And so they don't accept it, but they publish it. And it's out there, and people have copies. And it, and it says the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And he has added and changed things. Uh, he needed the Bible to say what would back up his, his new beliefs, and, and that was the purpose for him writing the book. And so by us knowing exactly what the original manuscript said, we can compare and contrast, and we can say, no, Joseph, you're wrong here. No, you're wrong here. Well, we can see what you're doing, why you wanted to say that, but that's not what it actually says. Your translation is an error because we have all this evidence that this is exactly what it says. The New World Translation is the Jehovah Witness Translation. They did, have done the exact same thing. They've changed a few things here and there, added, taken away, in order to fit their doctrine. And, and we know that because we have uh, established what the original manuscripts say. And, and when they say, no, it says this, we can say, well, how do you know that? They have no evidence. 
we can say, well, we know it doesn't say that. Here is the evidence. So that's another reason why we need this, this uh, area of study. C in your notes, we need textual criticism to protect God's word from false additions. Uh, a little bit repetitious, but you know we have additions that pop up through history, through time. The Apocrypha is one of these additions. The Apocrypha has been around for a long time. It was in the Bible, then it was out of the Bible, then it was in some of the Bibles, and it's, it's pretty much wound up finding itself in the Catholic Bible now. And the Apocrypha, for a, for a long time, was considered good reading. It, it's, it's not an evil thing that we need to run from, but, it, but it's not been considered an inspired part of the Word of God by the majority of folks. The Apocrypha has some history in it. It tells some of the Jewish history during the 400 silent years um, between Malachi and Jesus. It has uh, some, some inspirational things in it. Uh, it has some, some history, things like that. It also has some fiction in it uh, where it tells stories about how Jesus would entertain his friends by creating animals out of the dust and, and how one time he helped his dad who was building something and he cut the board too short. So Jesus grabbed the end of the board and stretched it to the right length so his dad wouldn't have to go get more wood. And, and so some fictional things like that. But we can, we can know that the Apocrypha doesn't match the original manuscripts because if we compare one to the other, they don't agree with each other. So that's one of the reasons we don't accept that. And then um, we have the Gnostic Gospels. Same, same kind of thing. The Gnostic Gospels oftentimes claimed authorship of, say, Thomas or Peter or one of the other disciples, yet they were written in the 3rd and 4th century. So they were written at a time when the authors were dead. And that's one of the reasons we know a lot of them are false. Plus, you have uh, false teachings and, and false history that they represent. And we can compare what we know are the original writings with what people are telling us were original writings. And we can compare the two and know which is true and which is not. The textual criticism gives us confidence in the original writings. And then D, we need uh, this, this area of study to clarify questionable differences found in various manuscripts. And that's where we're going to kind of turn today and look at, to clarify questionable differences. I, I wrote a little summary in the bottom of my notes. I want to read this to you. Textual criticism does not prove the message or interpret the words. We need to realize that. In, uh, textual criticism doesn't prove the message or interpret the words. Okay? It simply ensures that we are reading the Bible as given by God. So we can go to three or four different churches, and they may interpret a, a passage differently. And, and that, that actually happens. There, there's a reason why we have denominations, because there's differences in how we interpret God's word. And we look at things differently. But the words are the same. We have the same Bible in front of us, and then that gives us the opportunity to interpret it. So that's what textual criticism is. Uh, in your notes, continuing on, where, where are these differences found? And this gets into the controversy. This is where we step on toes and, and maybe cause people to not be happy about the discussion. Because the difference, A, in your notes, is usually between the King James Version of the Bible and then various modern translations. And, and I'll just stop there before we continue on in the notes. I want to say that the King James Version of the Bible is a, is a great Bible. And if, if you grew up reading it and it's the most easy for you to read now because it's, because it's the same as when you grew up, then continue reading it. It has, has led Christianity for, for centuries. It's not a bad translation, but it is different on certain places than newer translations. And so those who really want the King James to stand alone, they criticize the new translations because they, they, they take out a word or leave out a verse or say this or that. And then the people with the new translations, they criticize the King James because they say, hey, you missed this. And, and really, we don't need to have that argument we have a lot of good translations, the King James being one of them, the ESV, the NIV, the New LT, uh, a lot of these. We have a lot of good translations. So we don't need to get caught up in that. What we need to do is understand the subject matter so that when those who bring it up as a reason why they don't want to believe, we can have an intelligent conversation with them. And that's, that's kind of where we're heading in our sermon. Back to the notes, uh, the differences are usually found between King James and other versions. Here's why. Number one, 
The King James Version of the Bible is translated into English from one source. Okay? The source was the Textus Receptus. Now, the Textus Receptus was put together by a guy named Erasmus in 1516 AD, and it was based on six manuscripts. If you want to check out the accuracy of that, go to KGV Today. That stands for King James Version Today. This is a website where they work really hard to convince you that the King James is the only version. So their statistics are accurate in this area. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't agree that's the only version. I think it's great if it works for you. I think there's other versions that are also great. Um, but six manuscripts produced the Texas Receptus, and then the King James was translated from that. Okay, A little bit more complicated, but that's the general idea. Two in your notes, the NIV, the, so the New International Version, the New American Standard, the New Living Translation, the English Standard Version, and a lot of other versions, which are considered modern versions of the Bible, sourced over 25,000 manuscripts. We heard that in the video. Util they sourced 25,000 manuscripts utilizing the translation method known as critical or eclectic method. So the King James had a source and they translated it. They did the best they could. They did a very good job. They accurately translated their source material. So we have Erasmus collection of the scriptures into his Bible translated into the King James. These other ones have all the manuscripts, and, and this is possible because of the passage of time. Over time, more manuscripts were discovered. The Dead Sea Scrolls provided a lot of manuscript material. And so the critical method includes two ways of looking at the, the uh, manuscripts, because when you have 25,000 manuscripts, you're going to have variances in there. There's going to be little differences here and there, and we have to be able to decide which one is accurate. So A is external evidence. So when you're looking at external evidence, you ask these questions. How many manuscripts does the reading occur? So if you're looking at a single passage, you have 400 manuscripts that have that passage in it. You look at it, and if two of them say one thing and 398 say the other thing, that's a really strong vote that the 398 are correct and the two are wrong. It's not conclusive because the two could be right, but it's, it's just one piece of evidence. So you look at how many manuscripts there are, how many say each reading. We look at the dates for the manuscripts. The older manuscripts are, are believed to be more accurate because they've had less time to change, and they have more people who read the original to check it. So the closer to the original, the more accurate it's going to be. So you look at the dates of the manuscripts to see if there's a big difference between them. And then you look at what region were these manuscripts found? And, and you might say, well, what does that matter? Well, there was, there was areas of the world that painstakingly worked at, at translating, or not translating, but producing copies, and painstakingly worked to make sure every, every dot of the I was correct, every cross of the T was correct, every word was correct, no misspellings, even some to the point of where they misspelled the word, they'd tear out that whole page and start over. So some were meticulous in their copying, and then other regions, not so meticulous. One goal was to preserve the Word of God, and so they were very meticulous. Another one's goal was to get as many copies out as possible. And so there was more room for error there. And, and we can identify which groups did which. So they look at that kind of stuff. That's external evidence. There's more to that. I'm trying not to, not to bore you with the details. B is internal evidence. Uh, what could have caused these, these varying readings? Which readings explain the origin of the other reading? So here's an example uh, where Jesus is talking about the rich men getting into heaven, and he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that camel is the correct word. It fits the context. The next thing Jesus says is this is impossible with man. So it doesn't have to be possible. He's actually saying it's so impossible, it's like trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle. And that whole, that hole in the wall thing you've heard about where the camel gets down and crawls through and it's really hard but they can do it, doesn't exist. That's been disproven years ago, decades ago. Jesus is actually probably looking at a camel going, it's easier to get that camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now somewhere along the line, 
the word camel got changed to cord, C-O-R-D. And, and, and so we had a, a, a bunch of manuscripts that said it's easier for a cord to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And it, it sort of makes sense because a cord would be hard to get through the eye of a needle, but it seems like a little more plausible. Uh, maybe you could have a needle big enough for a rope to go through. Uh, and so it makes more sense. And so then the question was, is it supposed to be camel or is it supposed to be cord? Camel doesn't make a lot of sense because you could never do that. Of course, you look ahead and that's exactly the point. Um, so they had to say, okay, which, which is more likely to have been changed? Is it more likely to have been changed from camel to cord or from cord to camel? Well, someone along the way, oh, and here's something you need to know. There's like two little strokes of the pen difference in the word in the written form. So it could have just been an error. Could have just been a little, a little mistake. They copied it wrong, forgot to write something down. The pen didn't leave ink where it was supposed to leave ink. That could have been it. Or it could have been that someone didn't see the little stroke of the pen and thought it said chord, and chord made sense, so they recorded it. So we ask, well, which is, which is more likely? Well, it's more likely that someone thought, oh, it says chord. Other people think camel. I think it says chord. That makes more sense. I'm going to write that down. It's not logical for someone to say, oh, it says cord. It says it's harder to get a cord through the eye of a needle. I think Jesus meant camel. See, it doesn't really work that way. So we ask the question, and we can determine that, that it, camel was the correct word. Now, I've, I've simplified that. There's a lot more that goes on there, but that's some of the things that happen. And so here's another example. It's, it's John 5, 4. Uh, and it, so John 5, 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. That's, that's the King James reading of that verse because King James is really the only one that has it there. Almost all the rest don't. There, there may be one or two that do, but the majority don't. And so that verse is identified in all the new translations as not being in the original text. And so here's, here's the process. Here's how they came to that conclusion. Number one in your notes, the text of John 5.4 does not occur in most of the oldest manuscripts. So the older you get in the manuscript, the less likely that verse is to be there. And, and of course, the, the closer you get to the original, the more accurate it is. So that's clue number one. The earlier manuscripts don't have it. If it was in the earliest ones and not in the later ones, you would assume that it was supposed to be there. Number two, the text of John 5.4 occurs in all the, Benzin, the Byzant, Byzantine manuscripts, but not many of the non-Eastern manuscripts. So a region has it. All right? And I'll, I'll, that's, that kind of goes with number three. I'll read number three, and then we'll talk about that. It is more likely that a scribe, a scribe would add an explanation than to remove an explanation, making it more clear why the crippled man wanted to get in the pool. Okay, and I'll, I'll leave that last line for later. So a scribe writing it down for a Jewish audience wouldn't need the explanation of what the pool was, what the tradition was, why everyone was sitting there. But someone outside the region would read it, and they would ask the question, why would somebody be sitting outside a pool for 38 years? And so most likely, an explanation was added by a scribe. It may even have been separated there may have been just a note to the side somewhere for the people that the Byzantines were writing for or copying it for. Someone said, well, they're going to need this information in order to make sense of this passage, and they made a note. And then over the course of time, it, it's most likely that that note simply became incorporated into the text until eventually um, Erasmus has a text before him, a manuscript that has that language in the text with no markings, no separations, no notation that this is simply a, a, an editor's note, and it became part of the text, then that it was translated into the King James because it was in the manuscripts they had. So the last line there says it, it, it may have been added as a note. What I want to say is it may not have even been intentional. There, there may have been no point in time where someone said, I'm going to add to this book. It may have been completely unintentional. It may have even been beneficial in the beginning, 
and then misunderstood later on and, and, and finally just uh, absorbed into the text. So we, we take these together, and there's some other stuff. We take all this information together, and, and we realize the oldest manuscripts don't have that verse. It's only added in a certain region. And what makes sense? Would it be added or would it be taken away? That It would be added. We conclude it's not there. Now, I say we like I was involved in this conversation. I rely on much smarter people than I am who do this for a living to make these conclusions. And they look at huge amounts of evidence. I did an internet search. Okay? I, I, I went to those people to hear what they said. And then I went to other people to hear what they said. And when I found agreement among people I trusted, then I was willing to bring this to you. How should we deal with these differences? This is kind of what I want to get to today. How should we deal with these differences? Well, A, we deal with integrity and honesty. If, if you're having a conversation with someone and, and they're like, you need to use the King James Version of the Bible only because it has this verse and they took it out, and it has this verse and they took it out. Well, you need to have an, an honest dialogue with them. If you're on the other side of the coin and you say, well, you shouldn't ever use that, you should only use this new version because it had all this other manuscript, you need to have an intelligent conversation, a humble conversation. But more importantly, when you're talking to someone who's challenging the Word of God, when someone comes to you and says, you know what? I just can't trust a book that has all these errors in it. And they may throw out the number 6,000. There's over 6,000 errors in, in, in the, the Bible you have in your hand. That, that, that if you go back and you look at the manuscripts, in those 25,000 manuscripts, there's 6,000 errors. How can you trust a Bible that was translated from with all those errors? All those human hands that touched it corrupted it. You don't know what God said or didn't say. We don't even know if it's really God's word. It may just be something man made up. And, and we go through all this stuff. You need to be able to have a conversation, and you're going to gain ground if you speak with honesty. So here's a conversation. Here's some, some tips. One in your notes. You answer like this. Yes, yes, there were errors in changes made as scribes made handwritten copies. Yeah, there were. We know there were. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and we need to say, yeah, there was. There were errors that were made. And you can even say there, there's even errors that show up in some of our Bibles. And, and just go with that. Start them off with that, because you're probably going to catch them off guard. Oh, you agree? Oh, and you continue the conversation. Number two, 99% of the errors were spelling errors. 99% were spelling errors, the omission of a word, or writing the same line twice, or the same word twice. 99%. I bet if you, if you uh, proofread my notes, I've probably got nine or ten errors in two pages. It, it's a little game my kids used to play, find out how many errors Dad made in the notes. Um, and then they learn not to tell me later. But um, in, in two pages that, that I produce, there's, there's errors. I'm always finding errors. I'm crossing out words and rewriting what should be there, and then I read it hoping you don't notice. You know, there's, there's errors there. But 99% of the errors are, are simple things like, like I spelled Ed's name with one D instead of two. It's a misspelling. That's an error. Um, I, I, I was talking about Kaleo, but I called him Kalani. I've done that lots of times, right? <laughs> now that I've said it in my head, I'll probably do it some more. Those kinds of errors are the errors we're talking about, 99% of the errors. Uh, you're writing out a sentence, you know, and, and, and you leave out a word in the middle. That's... That's like the most of it. Of the 1%, we know exactly where they are and what the original text said. So in, in John 5, 4, we know exactly what's going on. We have a, a logical explanation of why it's there in some Bibles and not in others. We, we know what might have happened, but we know where it is. And we know what the original manuscript said because of textual criticism. And there's others. There's, there's actually four or five in the book of Mark. We, we stopped and talked about a couple of them. They're, they're all over the Bible, and, and we know. And we make note of the fact that some manuscripts say this, some don't. And, and this is what we think it should say. And, and then number four, not a single doctrine is changed or even questioned because of any such change or error. They can claim, you know, you, you narrow it down to, to, to really a, a very small number of, of things that, that we don't know for sure, like less than 10. 
in the entire Bible that we don't know for sure because it's an idiom, which is a phrase that only makes sense in the culture. And, and so we don't really know how to translate that. Usually they just translate that word for word, and then your pastor has to stand up front and go, I really don't know what this means, but this is kind of it. And, and so it doesn't change doctrine. It doesn't change anything like that. So we have integrity that we admit there's mistakes. We have honesty in what the errors are, and we simply conclude that it hasn't changed a thing. It doesn't change the gospel. It doesn't change the doctrine. It doesn't change who God is. And, you know, we know where they're at. And then B, we, we come in humility and awe. And here's where our faith should be, should be increased. Although man is not capable of protecting holy writing, God is more than capable and, and has indeed done so. God did not need 25,000 manuscripts. God provided 25,000 manuscripts. God didn't need any of them, but he gave them to us so that we can look and say, hey, you know what, these other books combined have 25 copies. Our single book has 25,000 copies. So we don't need to be concerned. We don't need to be worried. God has provided ample evidence that the Bible we have in our hands is accurate. And he's provided all, this, all these means to make sure it's true. Okay? And then so being in there is complete agreement in all major themes and doctrinal language. Not only has he kept it safe and provided ample truth, uh, it's, it all works together. There's one theme. The doctrines agree from page to page, from chapter to chapter, and book to book. So we're going to look at Mark 16, 9 through 20. We're going to finish Mark next week. And the questions are, uh, what do we know about its origin? What can we say about its presence in our Bibles? What do we do with it as far as study and application? So we're going to look at this and say, what do we do with it? If this whole idea of textual criticism kind of interests you, I left you a couple of resources there. John MacArthur did a great sermon. It's like an hour and 20 minutes long sermon. And, and he goes through example after example after example. He gives a lot of numbers and a lot of names. He names the, names the transcripts and all this stuff, talks about where they're found. He does a great uh, sermon on this, and it's actually on 9 through 20, where he doesn't spend any time on 9 through 20. He spends all the time on why it's there and why it shouldn't be there. And then Dr. Bill Mounts, if you search his name in textual criticism, are the Greek texts hopelessly corrupt? He does a great job on it, too. And uh, if you can't find it there, you can go to uh, biblicaltraining.org. You have to sign up for it, but it's free. And it, he has all these, there's all these classes on there. That's one of the classes he taught. So there's a ton more to do there. Here's, here's where we need to be at the end of today's sermon. Okay? We need to be awake. And I know that probably wasn't that exciting. But we need to, we need to now move forward into Mark 16, 9 through 20, asking the honest question, is this part of the Bible or is it not part of the Bible? And then based on that, what do we do with it? That's, that's where we're going to go next week. We look at Mark 16, 1 through 8, Mark 15. We look at Psalms, Daniel, John, Acts. We look at, look at the, other, the other parts of the Bible and we say to ourselves, the very study that's going to tell us what to do with 9 through 20 has already verified that 99.985% of the Bible is exactly what it was supposed to be and should be, and we could have confidence in it. I want you to leave today with confidence. I have ultimate confidence that if I tell you what the Bible says, it's good for you, and it's accurate, and it's God's message. I want you to leave with the same confidence. So let's pray. Father... Thanks for our time. Thank you that, that we can gather together. Lord, help us figure out this new routine. Help us figure out how to serve the body best and our community best. Help us to go out and Holy Spirit, help us just to reflect on Scripture and how you have protected it over the years and you have given it integrity by allowing the variances to be seen and explained and allowing the original manuscripts to be known. Bless us as we continue on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here, and have a great day. I will shake your hand at the door if you're shaking hands today. <laughs>